Good evening, and welcome once again to the Shadow Gallery. I am, as always, your host, James Donnelly. And tonight is part of this week's New Comics Bajan! But, to be fair, it is more of a retrospective, something that I've had planned pretty much this entire week. I figured I might as well get it out before tomorrow night's full review show. Because tonight, we are going to pay our respects to the demise, the however they may justify it, however they may see it, to a unjustly canceled far too long before its time title from DC's New 52. And of course, we're talking about Joshua Hale Fialkoff's I, Vampire, which came to an end after its 20th issue, technically issue 19, but of course there was the zero issue in there as well. Uh, so, in preparing for this, I got together, well, all of my issues, and in my trades, I know it's hard to see in this light, but you're looking at them. Uh, there we go. Volume 1, Tainted Love. Volume 2, Rise of the Vampires. And someday, before too long, we will have Volume 3, whatever they'll intend to call that because there are so many titles that they could possibly work with. Now, Rise of the Vampires admittedly was a crossover, but let's, let's, let's start in order. And I went, because I suck as far as filing my comics are concerned, because I filed them by year, and not by publisher or by title, but just kind of the year and week that they came out. So I don't have all of my paper copies. But I went on to the internets and found the, the titles of, of each issue because it's something that, of course, is worthy to explore when we talk about I, Vampire in its entirety. Because each issue has the, it, the title of each issue is the title of a song. Presumably that from certainly uh, as it comes, well, it, it starts to kind of, uh, it starts to kind of develop in the first arc, in the first six issue arc, uh, and then begins to coalesce a little bit more into the second arc and, of course, this, this last arc, they all have a very common theme. Uh, so just in going over the issues, let's start with, with the first one, which is titled Tainted Love. Of course, based on the soft cell song from the 1980s. And pretty much all of these songs, with the exception of one... And this is, uh, there's a big question mark because it is just a one word title and there are many bands that have used this particular name and I actually spent some time scouring through iTunes and through Amazon MP3 to try and find this, uh, a more obscure band to tie to this title, something from the 80s. But anyway, we'll, we'll get to that. So issue one, Tainted Love, where we first are introduced into the world of Andrew Bennett and Mary Seward, a.k.a. Mary Queen of Blood, where, of course, we see how, you know, Boston has, been, has almost been laid to waste uh, by Mary's 
army of vampires. And, you know, but, but before that, you know, when we go into flashbacks, we see that the two of them rekindling their love for one another, even though Andrew is good and Mary is evil, there's still a part of him that can't deny that love for her and how amazing she is to him. You know, so despite all of the animosity between the two over the years from their initial run, by uh, J.M. DeMatteis and Tom Sutton in the pages of House of Mystery from the 1970s and 80s, when it was still on. Um, and I loved the issues of Eye Vampire from that era, mostly because the, the covers were all done by Mike Kaluta. Um, Let's, I mean, let's face it, the, the Eye Vampire that was originally created was a good idea, but it was kind of a, I don't want to say poor man's attempt to kind of replicate the success of Marvel's Tomb of Dracula that was also going on around that time, but it was a desire to tell the story of a, you know, a vampire who is good, but who is, you know, constantly kind of fighting the bloodlust and, and so on and so forth while fighting his arch enemy, Mary Queen of Blood, you know, alongside, you know, his compatriots, Mishkin and Deborah Dancer. Um, and, you know, I've read those issues, I've read them all. Um, and, you know, they're all decent. Uh, but obviously with this reboot of DC with the new 52 and with new writers and artists, I'd never heard of Josh Fialkoff before. I'd never heard of Andrea Sorrentino before. And for, I don't know how many issues I thought Andrea Sorrentino was a woman, but it's a man. Um, because I'm ignorant that way. Uh, some male feminist I am, huh? Um, yeah, it's patriarchal shit. Anyway, so, you know, we see the evidence of their tainted love. Now then we get to the second issue titled, Girls Just Want to Have Fun, now, which is kind of the story from Mary's point of view, in which, indeed, yes, she is having, she is being entertained in her evil. Um, you know, so we see throughout that first issue, or throughout that second issue, I should say, where, you know, she's the, uh, the whole, the whole issue is told from her point of view, and told very beautifully, and then we get to issue three, which is, uh, which is the issue called Numb, where we first get to meet uh, John Troughton, Professor John Troughton, who is his old friend. Of course, then we also meet Tig Rafelson, the young and possibly psychotic vampire killer. And, you know, where they get, you know, and we have this kind of you know, where the hint of them going to Gotham City uh, comes into play, and, uh, you know, we get the, this book, this issue is told from, entirely from uh, Troughton's point of view, and we get the feeling that there is a strange sort of numbness that he feels. Um, and then we get to issue four, uh, which is called In Between Days, which is a song. Now, Numb, I can only uh, I can only speculate that he is using the U2 song as his inspiration there from Zuropa. I don't know. I, I'm hoping, Josh, that if you end up watching this, that you'll tell me. <laughs> um, because I want to know. Uh, but Four is In Between Days, and a song by The Cure. 
which is not a band I'm very fond of, to be perfectly honest, but that is the art that is the issue, of course, where we meet John Constantine in this universe and how he comes to eventually play a part. And, of course, this is where uh, we see how... Um, Andrew is, is first trying to uh, relate and maybe teach this man that he meets, this vampire that he meets, on how to, you know, control and how to not to give in to the urges of the bloodlust by taking lives. And, of course, that backfires horribly. And... He is forced, then forced to kill this vampire, which of course turns out to be Tig's father, which of course comes into play later in the book, or in the series, I should say. And then we get to issue five, uh, which is Gouge Away, which is a song by, it's the last track on Doolittle by the Pixies which is one of my favorite albums of all time. And it is when, indeed, they do get to Gotham City and Mary has already tried to turn everybody and we do have, the, of course, the appearance of Batman here. And then we get to issue six, which is uh, This Charming Man which uh, is a Smith song, of course. And this, of course, is where we... where Fialkov slays Andrew Bennett, the lead character of the comic. In the first six issues, Josh Fialkoff has killed his main character. And, of course, this has released Cain, basically the ultimate evil. And because his imprisonment is directly tied to Cain, of course, that's something that we find out later. Uh, then we, you know, we start to get into the Rise of the Vampire crossover between Justice League Dark and uh, um, and of course I Vampire. Now, with the exception of once we get to sorry, once we get to issue six, we finally are treated to our first. Uh, excuse me, just uh, making sure that this is correct. Yeah, we finally get treated to our first Sorrentino cover because the the initial six, the initial five issues had the cover art, as we see here from this cover of Jenny Frizzon. And this was something that most fans of this book ended up kind of hating because it seemed, it looked very emo. Uh, it looked like they were kind of trying to gather the Twilight crowd and everything like that with these images that were on these covers. And it kind of doesn't work. Which is sad, but it's true. I mean, to be frank, I don't care for the Jenny Frieson covers. And I think that's one of the reasons that they changed cover artists, you know, with Sorrentino finally getting one uh, with, uh, with six. And then we have this crossover between, uh, between JLD and iVampire with the Rise of the Vampire arcs, which is where we find out exactly what the hell is going on in Gotham and with the uh, uh, and what's going on with uh, the JLD and then we get to issue 7 entitled Blame It on Kane uh, which is an Elvis Costello song 
and not a huge fan of Elvis Costello's voice, but I do love his lyrics. Um, and of course, this is where we really do get the the tale of Cain, and you know how you know Andrew Bennett is again is tied to the release of Cain and what exactly it all means. And you know, of course, then we get the uh, you know we see. Um, the uh, you know we we see uh, you know Mary turn around because she's pissed off that she no longer rules these vampires, and then we get to uh, then we get to uh, the in between issue of uh, JLD in which we finally you know when we finally do get the return of Andrew Bennett to Terra Firma. And then and again another uh, cover by Sorrentino for uh, for number eight, which is Cruel to Be Kind is the title, uh, which of course is the famous Nick Lowe song. And you know, he has, you know, and indeed it is cruel, you know, what, what Andrew Bennett does here is to be cruel, to be kind, which is that he uses his abilities to basically, you know, he uses these newfound abilities that he's brought back from his death to reform vampires and to steal the power of Cain and declares himself as a patriot of vampires. And so indeed, you know, his cruelty is to, you know, is to take the, you know, the vampire army and take them with him to Utah. In which case, you know, so that he, he can basically protect them. And then we have, uh, then we have another uh, beautiful Sorrentino co cover which has the words "Bite, Pray, Love" uh, on the cover, and it's and this issue is "Hurry Down Doomsday." Um, number nine, and again we have another Elvis Costello song, and, or, you know, the bugs are taking over, of course, there's a subtitle there, and this is where, you know, of course they meet, you know, where, uh, you know, Troughton and Tig go to meet the Van Helsings, so basically they can bring them to, uh, uh, to confront Andrew Bennett, And then, of course, we have, you know, this kind of epic fight, you know, this epic brawl brewing between, uh, uh, between Mary and Andrew, of course, for, you know, his new super, super powers, uh, for the, um, uh, basically for who's going to rule the vampires once again. And then we have... Uh, issue 10, uh, which is Waiting for the End of the World, which is, of course, where um, this fight between Mary and Tig commences and, or, excuse me, Mary and Andrew commences, and we have the, uh, the initial wave of assault, uh, you know, via napalm by the, you know, the, the, the you know, zealots that form the Van Helsings, and you know we have the uh, zombie mummy vampires. <laughs> you know, it starts in this. Uh, this issue actually is uh, the first issue to have a cover by uh, Clayton Crane, 
uh, who is, of course, you know, uh, a pretty brilliant artist in his own right. And then, of course, uh, issue 11, The Drowning Man, another song by The Cure, uh, is, uh, again, covered by Crane. And we have... Uh, the you know kind of the you know the final battle between the well not the final battle between the Van Helsings and the vampires and so zombie vampire vampire hunters yep it's you know and again you know Mary and Andrew reteaming to destroy the the vampire uh, you know the vampire zombie zombie hunters and then we have issue 12 disintegration and of course another cure song uh, again cover art by Clayton Crane and we have the introduction here of Stormwatch into the eye vampire world and we have basically the most shocking finale of all of the issues in which basically Andrew uses all of his strength and the, the demon's lock that is talked about in regards to Cain. And he uses all of his abilities to take the power away from all of the vampires, to basically cure all of the vampires on the planet Earth, presumably. And, of course, this is where Andrew becomes evil. So at this, the end of the second arc of the book, as with the first arc and how that ends, we have another incredibly stunning ending, which is where we are just left with our mouths agape because Andrew Bennett has become evil. and has turned Tig into his first child. And then we have the issue zero, which goes back in time to the 1500s, and we see uh, the beginnings of Andrew's life as a vampire, and how it was Cain that indeed turned him. And that issue uh, called uh, Break My Body. And here we go into the real motif of the titles all having the same connecting thread is that they are all Pixie songs from here on out. No switching around from one artist to the other, just all Pixies all the time, B-sides. And thanks to my wife who is a enormous, enormous Pixies fan. Uh, I like the Pixies a lot. I, you know, I think that Doolittle is brilliant. I'm not a huge fan of Surfer Rosa or Trompe Monde or you know, some of the other albums that exist by the Pixies. But uh, whatever, I still uh, I can still appreciate them. Um, and this is kind of a this is kind of a gimme because there is a book, there was a comic that was released very independently that is based, you know, like, there is one uh, that was released uh, called Shoplifters, Shoplifters of the World Unite, or just called Unite and Take Over, excuse me, and it's based on the songs of the Smiths. And they did basically the same thing with the Pixies. And I do have both of these books, and they're quite good. They're really fun. Um, and Josh Fialkoff, I didn't even know about it until I went I went into my local comic store and my friend there, Miguel, had, you know, who ran the place, secured me a copy of this book because he saw the name Josh Fialkoff and assumed 
I would want it, and he was right. But not only this, this made this made me happy to see a Josh Fialkoff story at all. But it also it made my wife much happier to have a book based on Pixie songs. So, um, and then we have uh, issue thirteen, where we have. Uh, which is entitled Debaser, which of course is the first track off of Doolittle. And this is the issue in which Mary, we basically deal with Mary, it's told entirely from her point of view, where Mary is now human and has to deal with being human, but she realizes that she's not, you know, being a vampire is not what makes her awesome it's being her that makes her awesome. You know, she does fend off uh, some mortal, some mere mortals who are trying to attack her, um, and does so with a great deal of fortitude and, and and zeal. Doesn't kill them, but you know, certainly does put a good hurting on them. And just what a great issue that was. Uh, and then we have. Uh, with issue 14, we have Winter Long. Again, Pixies. And here we have, now that's a B-side, if I'm not mistaken, or a rarity. And in that issue, we are reintroduced to Deborah Dancer. And this is still, uh, we still have Sorrentino on art. And Deborah Dancer finally gets her place in the new iVampire universe, and of course we have the dog Mishkin, because now, th this is something that I'm a little unclear on, because I do have those issues, but I don't really recall what happened to Deborah Dancer in regards to the fact that she apparently was dead for a time and came back. I really have to kind of Wikipedia her character, <laughs> um, which is something I actually meant to do and kind of feel dumb that I didn't. But... Anyway, that's where we are. And Winter Long basically, you know, gives us the, you know, the idea, you know, the kind of reintroduction once again of her character and her introduction to Andrew Bennett, you know, of course, believing that he's good at first, but of course is now evil with Tig. And who comes in to help save the day for Deborah, but Troughton and Mary, human, and now one of the good guys. And then we have issue 15, Here Comes Your Man. Dur, 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 dur. Um, and we have... This is basically where the title loses... Andrea Sorrentino, and gets, at least for one issue, gets Dennis Calero. And we have the issue where it's basically, they are looking, you know, looking to escape from, you know, Deborah. <laughs> and, well, unfortunately, Michigan ain't going to make it because he's a vampire dog now. And, but Deborah and Troughton and... Tig and, uh, excuse me, Mary have more or less successfully saved Deborah for the time being and brought them into their fold to help fight Andrew. And all, of course, for their own reasons. John still believes in his uh, abilities to be good. And... Uh, you know, Mary just kind of wants to beat him down, but also kind of enjoying being a good guy for a little while. And then, you know, Deborah, who is always one of the good guys, really. But this is basically when, you know, we have the introduction of our young uh, magician, Jonathan, who is... Know, who they have recruited to take with them 
to the castle of the Van Helsings. And, you know, number 16, we have Nimrod's son. And, again, Bixie's song. And, you know, this is where we meet. You know, we've just, we left off with this uh, kind of moment of Cain appearing at the end of uh, issue 15 as human. And they're trying to discuss how, in fact, to defeat uh, Andrew and, you know, his cabal. And uh, this issue no longer by, you know, we get, again, kind of the, the origin story of Cain and Lilith and how they birthed all of these vampire children. Now, they, they were, in fact, the first man and woman to walk on the face of the earth. And it was, uh, we have, Scott Clark was the lead artist on this, and his art was actually quite beautiful, but then there was a mix of different artists in this issue, which did, unfortunately, I think, hurt the issue. Uh, because, you know, a lot of the art was you know, very good, and some of it was just very kind of crazy. Um, but we did get our first taste of Fernando Blanco on that title, on that particular issue, I should say. And then we get to issue 17, in which, you know, basically at the, the end of 16, they have found, the they've broken into the armory of the Van Helsing. And they're looking for something very specific. And it turns out to be, as we find out in issue 17, Wave of Mutilation. It is a, an artifact that will, you know, a, you know, the, you know uh, one of the stones from the Tower of Babel that will reach both above and below the Earth and basically connect Hell and Heaven so that they can destroy the world. And this, of course, was all taking place in the hijacked House of Mystery from John Constantine, who is none too plussed about this. And, but because of the action that they've taken that Andrew and, and Tig, um, you know, they basically, everybody goes into the House of Mystery and are all confronted by their own demons. And you have the death by Andrew Bennett's hand of John Troughton, as we discover really for the first time, even though it's kind of implied in other parts of the series that John Troughton was gay and was more than likely in love with Andrew Bennett. And it, of course, is Andrew who kills him. And we have Fernando Blanco who's taken over on art for this issue. And again, everybody meeting, you know, some of their worst fears, greatest fears, you know, Deborah Dancer sees Michigan turned into a vampire. Mary is confronted with many of the bodies that she's, you know, left dead and bleeding over the years. And of course, it's where Constantine tries to turn the tables on Andrew by using the information of that the locket that was found by Tig in the Van Helsings of her father, who she actually believed to be the Van Helsings who killed her father, but in fact, it was Andrew Bennett. So what do we have here but Mary again turning back to, you know about to turn back to Andrew's side until she is beheaded by Tig who uses this as vengeance to because of her father's death by the hands of Andrew Bennett and we even get the sword pointed at Andrew Bennett as she says, you killed my father, prepare to die. 
If only she said, hello, my name is Tig Rafelson before that. <laughs> but that thing it would have been a little bit too on the nose. And then we have issue 18, Dig for Fire. And which is where we have Kane, who is used, you know, who has, uh, who's using his newfound power to restore Lilith, and he does so by basically taking, basically removing all of the kind of all of the, the souls of the vampires that Andrew himself had consumed to reincarnate Lilith in the body of Tig. And of course at the end of this, in the finale moment, as this bridge, this abyss between earth, hell, and heaven grows to a, a critical mass, if you will. We have the resurrection of Mary, who's come back for one final round. And here we get to this week's final issue, issue 19, called Caribou. Again, another Pixie song. And basically what we have here, and here we're going to review that issue. Finally getting around to that. Where basically we have a monstrous, bloody, terrifying, magical free-for-all as we have Andrew, Mary, Lilith, Cain, Constantine, Deborah, and Jonathan, and the librarian, all basically doing battle as Andrew is now restored to his good side because it was the the powers that he absorbed from Cain that had eventually corrupted him and it was just a matter of time before he made that final decision to you know in issue 12 to absorb all the vampires into him to stop the uh, to stop the onslaught of the Van Helsings And, you know, basically Andrew here working alongside the resurrected Mary, who is literally and figuratively a deus ex machina. She has come back from her death and is there to stop Cain and Lilith. And, you know, Jonathan, who is only interested in the protection of his would-be girlfriend, Tig, uh, has, you know, really, uh, you know, it, it is, you know, in support of protecting Lilith, who, of course, is still in Tig's body, but, you know, so we have, of course, Deborah also working alongside Mary, which is, again, another, you know, the book kind of coming a little bit full circle here. Uh, basically to put an end to Cain and Lilith, which the librarian and Jonathan are actively fighting against. Not to mention Cain and Lilith. Um, and basically we have this intermittent flashback scenes, because the primarily the art in this issue is by Fernando Blanco, but we do get a very, very welcome return by Andrea Sorrentino to do these flashbacks to basically when Mary first was turned into a vampire by Andrew Bennett. And we see in these opening moments that she's washing herself, and we don't know 
exactly why, but we hear, you know, part of her internal monologue about how Lord Bennett, Andrew's father, has been grossly mistreating her uh, and believes to be the reason that her son ran off because he could not be with Mary, who was just a common maid, you know, a, you know, his whore. And basically we come to, again, this watershed of the issue in which basically the, the key to Sorry, I've got blood on me, and I'm, I'm not joking. No, it's just a cut my thumb. Anyway, I don't know how, but it happened. Anyway, so we have this, uh, uh, the, and here's where we have this very interesting little throwback to the origins of the House of Mystery and the House of Secrets, in which Cain is brought from, you know, he he is connected and imprisoned within the House of Mystery. And so basically, Andrew bets his restored soul by bringing him to the area in which he would be imprisoned, and who is there but Lucifer. And some of his court. And Lucifer deems, again, Cain that he is to be punished for all of eternity for his sins. But, of course, their eyes turn towards Andrew Bennett. And they, you know, and one of Lucifer's court points out that he, that Andrew had the mark of Cain. But it is purged from him and so he is safe, but Cain is not, and therefore Cain is imprisoned within the walls of the House of Mystery, again, for all eternity. And Lilith's soul is sucked back into the maw of this hell in which uh, Andrew does because the like it was the librarian who opened this it is only the flesh of the librarian that can close it so no you know since he's now a vampire really no huge you no know, really no huge internal struggle for andrew just to push him right into the maw and close off this portal and it destroys the rock from the tower and all is restored Tig returns, although still dressed like Lilith, uh, and gains back her hand, which had been cut off, um, and her and Jonathan make a run for it. And <laughs> Constantine's just standing outside, and, you know, just, of course, puffing on a smoke, and he asks the two runaway lover vampires if they plan on killing people. And of course, Tig's response to that is, hell yes. To which Constantine's response is, uh, vampires in love. That's, that's Andrew's area of expertise. <laughs> and then we have this final moment where even in victory, it is time for Andrew and Mary's love story to come to an end. Because unlike Andrew, as she points out, she doesn't get the chance to come back over and over again. She was here to help stop Cain on the behalf of whatever higher power had restored her. And it's time to go. We do get a final embrace, final proclaiming of love, final kiss, and she fades away. And then we have 
final moment between Andrew and Deborah, who has survived. And again, there's not a like an overwhelming sadness there for Andrew. He is sorry, of course, that his great love is gone. But in a way, he's glad because she's finally free. And it's basically a good ending for everybody involved. But the issue's not over. Because we do go back to the flashbacks. And we see, basically, Andrew and Mary. He has just turned her, presumably. And we start to see how Mary has truly become evil. That she is willing to give give over entirely to the bloodlust that she feels, even though Andrew warns her against it. And she describes why humanity should be their cattle. Because she's not inherently evil and never was, but it was Bennett's father who had been basically not only, you know, being, you know, verbally and mentally abusive, but quite physically abusive and has taken it upon himself to rape her a number of times. And of course, Andrew can't take back what he's just done and she flees with basically these last words of wisdom for Andrew to look in on his father before he leaves as well. And he goes downstairs to witness or to see his father butchered, beheaded, and this is while Mary was still human that she did this, which is why we see her washing at the beginning of the issue. So her turn to evil began before he ever turned her into a vampire. And Andrew is left wondering, what hath I wrought? And that's where the book and the series and the title ends. Not with this great feeling of accomplishment, which is there, but with this horrific discovery of what he could not have known because, well, what he didn't care to know before he turned her is that because he just didn't care anymore. He wanted to be with her for all of eternity. His love for her was that strong. And, but she had already gone over the edge, far past it. So, we get the beginnings of Mary's evil at the very end of this book. I want to say that we haven't heard the last of Andrew Bennett and Deborah Dancer, who are, you know, and Tig and Jonathan. I'm sure that they will come into play at some point in the future, probably in the pages of Justice League Dark, because that's the only book that I could trust to bring some of these characters back because obviously there's already been, you know, Lemire has already used Andrew Bennett in his title during his run and I can only hope and pray that their stories are not over 
even though this title is. Because, hey, I mean, if, you know, Lemire obviously brought, you know, his own creation, Frankenstein, onto the JLD. And I think there's definitely room for at least one more member. And I think that's easily... Andrew Bennett could be that new member. I can only hope. But this is the last we'll be seeing of Fialkov from DC, probably for a really long time, obviously after his leaving, uh, his, you know, what would have been, what would have come to be his work on the Green Lantern Corps and Red Lanterns. Not necessarily in favor of, but so that he could work at Marvel. And of course, we have him currently working on Alpha Big Time. He will be, excuse me, he will be writing The Ultimates very shortly. His run on The Ultimates will begin after uh, the current arc has ended, which will end after the next issue. Uh, after or Sam Humphries' arc will end after this 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 next issue that's coming up. And, of course, he has his own creator-owned series that will be coming out of Dynamite. I don't know when, but I'm hoping it's soon, and that's The Devilers. So I think Josh Fialkov has a bright future over at Marvel and at Dynamite, and hopefully, again, at Image, if he can create another series as awesome as The Last of the Greats, and that hopefully will garner some more attention because this was a book that, you know, I understand, you know, with Vaughn and, uh, and Fiona Staples and Saga, I can understand them taking a hiatus to see how well the, the trades will sell. But, I mean, let's face it, this is going to, you know, that's going to be a book that will survive. But, unfortunately, it was up to the sales of The Last of the Greats trade to unfortunately undersold to determine the future of Last of the Greats. And that of course would have led way to Return of the Greats. But I think that if Fialkov keeps continuing strong at Marvel, which he's doing right now already with Alpha Big Time, I believe, uh, and does some really good work with uh, with the Ultimates that and you know the work with the Devilers that Image might look at returning to Fialkov's ideas. Of course, you know, and Fialkov does you know it seems like almost every year uh, put forth a uh, a pi during Top Cow's pilot season he'll put out a first issue and then leave it to us to vote. And of course, you know, I voted heavily, you know, <laughs> votes, uh, vote early and vote often. Uh, and I did for his uh, last series, The Test, uh, to become a pot, you know, to become a full, you know, to become a series at Top Cow. Unfortunately, that lost. Um, and it's a shame because I think that the idea behind the the list was, or I'm sorry, the test was a very strong one. But alas, didn't happen. And, you know, so, and obviously, you know, his work on Echoes, which is literally one of the most terrifying reading experiences I have ever had in my life, uh, for a number of different reasons, not just because it's an incredibly beautifully told horror story, psychological horror story, uh, but, you know, again, just for my own personal reasons. And Tumor, again, his brilliant kind of noir uh, detective story, and Elk's Run, his kind of almost Lord of the Flies-ish tale that he tells there, so, I mean, the man does really, really fucking great work. And this issue, again, is evidence to that. Because we have this ending, like I said, to the series, which is, 
you know, even in this this moment of triumph of good over evil, we go back. You know, Fialkov is smart enough to go back and return us to the horror. Part of what made this horror comic so brilliant is that it was indeed great horror. But it was also great character and great dialogue and amazing art by Sorrentino until he left to do Green Arrow. And I can certainly understand that. I mean, Green Arrow is Green Arrow. You know, it's a winner. It's going to be a winner, at least for a while. And with Lemire writing it, it certainly has a stronger following, I think, right now than it, uh, it did with uh, J.T. Krall, who was writing it. Um, but we haven't seen the last of Yalkov, and I'm just really hoping that we haven't seen the last of Andrew Bennett and Deborah Dancer and Tig Rafelson and Jonathan, because it would just be a fucking travesty. I mean, obviously, the cancellation of this title is already a travesty in my mind. You know, there are so many other titles that could have been tossed by DC to make way for... I mean, you know, this was one of the most widely beloved amongst critics and amongst, uh, you know, amongst fans of this title. I mean... You couldn't stop reading I Vampire, even if you wanted to. I mean, I, I went on Amazon's uh, I went on Amazon's page today because I, I do obviously write a lot of reviews for Amazon, and uh, I reviewed both volumes of uh, of I Vampire: The Trades, and when the third one comes out, I'll do that one too. But you know, I was surprised to see there was one. Actually, only two. There, there, there weren't many customer reviews for the second volume. There weren't a whole lot of reviews for the first trade either. But almost all of them were incredibly positive. You know, at least at least four stars. Some five, like my own. And then there was this one jackoff who did one star on both, because he apparently bought both at the same time and called it whiny emo crap. And I say to that man right now, if he may be watching, fuck you. <laughs> okay? This is the farthest thing from whiny, goth, emo, whatever you want to slap a label on it. This is grand, great, brilliant horror storytelling. And... I mean, the voices that Fialkov created for this book, whether or not it was, you know, with the existing characters of Deborah and Mary and Andrew, but with the new characters of John Troughton, of Tig, and of course, you know, the voice of John Constantine that he uses in this book, voice of Batman. I mean, this is a guy who knows his characters and knows how to use them and to utilize them. And of course, the members of Justice League Dark that you know, make an appearance. And of course, this one, Peter Milligan was still writing it before uh, Lemire took over, thankfully. Um, but all in all, it'll be a long time before there's another book like this, another horror book that is an ongoing series and part of the regular universe as a whole. You know, I mean, as far as DC's new, you know, as far as the DC universe, the main DC universe, we're not going to see the likes of this. I don't think for a really long time, if we ever do. I, I will say again, but like I said, just for a really long time. Of course, you have some great horror titles coming out of Vertigo. You still have, you know, American Vampire, of course, is on a long hiatus. We've got Snyder and Murphy's The Wake coming up, uh, which I'm 
you know, fiercely looking forward to. And, you know, Animal Man, uh, Swamp Thing, of course, they're kind of horror titles, but not really. So, but this was really the only pure horror title of the New 52 that actually had something to say in the regards of just from a storytelling standpoint. It's hard for me to name my favorite issue of this title because there are at least three incredibly brilliant issues. If I had to rank them, I would say that they, if I must, they would go in this order. Well, okay, I mean, there are four, because I'm forgetting about the first issue, because the first issue was, you know, uh, you know if I hadn't fallen in love with the first issue, I would have just said, eh, whatever. But the first issue, Tainted Love, of course, incredible, it's brilliant. But I would say that I would rank them this way. I would say that issue six, This Charming Man, The Death of Andrew Bennett, would be my third favorite. Taint, you know, uh, Tainted Love would be you know, fourth, if I had to, again, if I had to rank. But my second favorite issue and my first favorite issue are up for grabs, pretty much, but I have to put number two as issue 13, Debaser, which is, of course, the story of Mary being human, because it was just such a brilliant issue in regards to not only plot, but very especially character. Again, you know, this reaffirmation of who exactly Mary is and why exactly she is who she is, and just such a great, great character, and I'm, you know, I got choked up reading that, this last issue, because to see her go, it actually felt like there was somebody leaving me. This whole issue felt like this was a friend that was no longer going to be in my life. I mean, I know that some people feel this way about, uh, you know, television shows when they go off the air. You know, I certainly felt it, you know, when shows like, you know, Buffy and Angel went off the air. It's like, these are a group of people that I'm not going to be seeing every week anymore. And, you know, any other number of, you know, series, Battlestar Galactica, you know. Like I said, I mean, it's just, you know, Smallville. I mean, admittedly, it's not quite on the level of these other shows, but that's still a show that I was sad when it went away <laughs> because I had become so heavily invested in all of those characters and, you know, it was sad to see them go. But we were at least treated, and we are being treated, to Smallville Season 11 through the comics, which uh, it's been a while since I've actually gotten the issues, so I need to start getting those again. But, you know, when, you know, this is, you know, ultimately this is a friend that's gotten me through some pretty rough times. You know, if I felt, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not bullshitting either because this is a, a book that did kind of help me get through some pretty shit times in my life. You know, I mean, the first issue came out not too long after my mother passed away. And, you know, this was one of those books that I could always go back to if I wanted to read really brilliant storytelling, which is why I have the individual issues and I have the trades. I mean, I 
got them because, you know, at least initially I got the trades because I felt this was, a, you know, a series that was on the cusp. And of course, you know, as soon as it was announced that the, uh, that the series was coming to an end, I immediately pre-ordered and called for the rest of you to pre-order the trade of Rise of the Vampires. And I know some of you got it, but unfortunately it still didn't make any difference. But if I was, you know, if I was to vote for the number one issue, ironically with my, with, uh, probably the least favorite band of all of the, uh, you know, with the title, with the titles, you know, with the title being a song from my least favorite band of the list. Hey, there are two Cure songs that I absolutely fucking love more than, you know, some of my favorite songs ever, but is issue 12, Disintegration, where we have, you know, this huge status quo changer of Andrew Bennett turning evil once again. I mean, the whole issue is just perfect from an artistic standpoint, from a storytelling standpoint, from a character standpoint, as we get, you know, Apollo, Midnighter, Jack Hawksmore from Stormwatch coming in and, you know, they kind of bypass the whole kind of meet cute, fight cute thing. You know, there is a brief fight, but it's just like, oh, okay, well, we understand this is just a big misunderstanding because there, you know, because if that was one thing that this book kept doing, it was the defiance of traditional, you know, standard serialized comic storytelling. Not that it's, you know, not that it threw all the rules out the door, but it did throw quite a few of them and it played with the tropes of these, of how these stories usually come out and it had fun with them. And that was, again, that's another huge thing about this book is that it was incredibly fun. I mean, even though it is a horror book and it is very horrifying at some points and it's just like, oh God, this is freaking me the fuck out right now. But it's insanely fun to read because of all of the humor that Fialkov keeps injecting into the characters and all of the emotion that you feel radiating forth from these characters. So to all of you who were Team I Vampire, Team Bennett, to Josh Fialkov, to Andrea Sorrentino, to Fernando Blanco, Scott Clark, Dennis Calero. Thank you from the bottom of my blood pumping heart for giving us 20 issues of certainly a lot more often than not brilliance. And that is my ode to I Vampire and his passing. And yes, I Vampire number 19 is a perfect 5 out of 5. So, thank you for watching. If you're listening on iTunes, thank you for listening. If this is your first time here, please feel free to, to subscribe. You might want to look at some of my other videos. Uh, because they're all long, <laughs> uh, but I do cover a lot of titles, so I do like talking about comics, and I especially like talking about comics that I really love. So I know this isn't maybe as long as the kind of ode that I did to Secret Six, or this, or let's just say this is much longer than the ode that I did to the uh, the finale of Secret Six, but. If I were to rank comics right now, I would have to say that I, Vampire, never let me down. Secret Six didn't really let me down, 
aside from a misstep here or there, but very forgivable because it was still the best team book that DC has put out in a really long time. So please feel free to comment. I encourage comments. And I will say again, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And I'll be back tomorrow night with a full episode of New Comics, bitches! So stay tuned for that. But for tonight, we're saying good night, farewell, Elf Leaders in. Good night, Andrew Bennett. And good night, Mary Seward. Good night, Deborah Dancer. Good night, Tig Rafelson. Good night. Professor John Troughton. May flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. I'm James Donnelly. You've been watching the Shadow Gallery. Good night. And always, stay in the shadows.